right, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm really excited about this panel, and we can make it an intimate conversation. Um, kind of silly that we're on um, mics in a way, but uh, I am Kristen Hamilton. I am the entrepreneur, former CEO of Koru and Anvia, and also have, um, I work with Entangled. Really excited about this panel. I want to start by reading a quote um, by, from a book that Emily Chang wrote called Brotopia. Who, who here has heard of the book? Okay, who here has read the book? Who here is the husband of Emily Chang? <laughs> We're so lucky she happens. He happens to be sitting here. Lucky you, it's your claim to fame. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was a book that was published number five years, four years ago? One year. One year ago only, but it was research started a number of years ago. It was very famous, made a lot of waves in Silicon Valley, called Brotopia, Breaking Up the Boys Club in Silicon Valley. Um, this is an excerpt. Getting to 50-50 is incredibly complex and nuanced, requiring many detailed solutions that will take decades to fully play out. To accelerate the process, change needs to start at the top. CEOs need to make hiring and retaining women an explicit priority. In addition, here is the bare minimum um, of what we can do at an individual and systemic level. First of all, people, be nice to each other. Treat one another with respect and dignity, including those of the opposite sex. That should be pretty simple. Don't enable assholes. Start make, uh, stop making excuses for bad behavior or ignoring it. CEOs must embrace and champion the need to reach a fair representation of gender within their companies and develop a comprehensive plan to get there. Be long-term focused, not short-term. It may take three weeks to find a white man for the job, but three months to find a woman. Those three months could save three years of play, playing catch-up in the future. Uh, she goes on to say, this is an industry, after all, that prides itself on disruption and revolutionary new ways of thinking. Let's put that spirit of innovation um, and embrace uh, to work and, let's, and embrace a, a radical change, um, putting radical change to good use. Seeking more inclusive workforce in Silicon Valley will encourage more girls and women studying computer science now. So she obviously did a ton of research and uh, there was a lot of sort of interesting evidence that came out in that book about what's going on in Silicon Valley with what we're calling bro culture in this panel. And I'm excited to hear from our panelists who are CEOs of, of tech companies about their experiences um, with bro culture, with culture and how to develop a healthy culture in their startups um, and, um, and what they're doing actively to ensure that. So I'm going to quickly introduce you all. Um, and even though we're not supposed to take time doing this, I think it's nice to know who's sitting on the stage. Um, Garrett is a CEO and founder of Handshake, the ultimate career network and recruiting platform for students. He was a top 30 under 30 uh, named by Forbes. Started Handshake when you were still in college, is that true? Um, so has a real perspective on that um, audience, obviously. Kate Walker. Is it Kate Eberly Walker? Or Kate, Kate Walker? Eberly Walker. Kate Eberly Walker is the CEO of Presence Learning, a company that connects speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, and behavioral and mental health professionals with students through its proprietary online platform for K-12 schools. She's a former CEO of Princeton Review, and she was a senior leader at Kaplan and has been an investor in education companies, started her career as an investment banker at Goldman Sachs. <laughs> uh, Brian... Gray is the CEO of Remind, a communication platform that helps every student succeed by allowing educators to reach students and parents where they are. He's a veteran of the technology industry, having worked for AOL, Yahoo, Shutterfly, and um, done a lot in the sports and sports technology business for Sp Fox Sports, Nike, MLB. I was the CEO of Bleacher Report and has been a lecturer at Stanford GSB. I'm and, really old. <laughs> really. A lot of awesome experience to speak from. And uh, Brent Avalord, Alvord, sorry. Alvord, Alvord yeah. is a CEO and co-founder of Neatwork, a company that helps people, teams, and organizations maximize their potential through visibility, access, and alignment to work that matters. Very relevant around this topic. Uh, spent 10 years in investment banking and became fixated on how to build high-performing teams, how leaders influence organizations, and how to help people grow their careers. Um, and you're now building software to help companies deploy these uh, concepts at scale. So thank you very much for being here. Um, quick show of hands, anyone leading a team? Who leads a team? Yeah, um, okay. And then is this a show of hands, is, is this idea of this bro culture rel like a, something you think about in your, in your organization, something that is a factor in your, in your organization? Yeah, good, makes sense. 
in terms of you being here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this in, th in three parts. We're going to, I'm going to stop talking, um, but we're going to first um, address the question <coughs> of what is a bro, bro culture? And frankly, why is it bad? Right? And maybe seems obvious to some, but maybe not. And I think it's a good place to start is what does it mean um, before we start talking about how do we address it. Um, then the second is what can leaders do to build a company without a bro culture? And thirdly, how do you fix it once it's there? So different to try and fix it when you've already got um, a situation where that dynamic exists. So I'm going to start by going down the line, and each of you is just going to go ahead and um, give me kind of your take in you know, a few sentences. What is, how would you define what is bro culture? And we'll just do kind of a quick lightning round and then we'll dive in a little bit more. Great. Uh, thank you, Kristen. So I think bro culture is uh, when you're working on a team or an environment where, you're, um, where you don't feel like you belong or that your thoughts are represented around the table. And because of that, you're not able to bring like your full self into work and really contribute in a meaningful way to the organization. And I think, um, Pro culture ultimately manifests itself in terms, in terms of like breeding uh, kind of worse business outcomes because you don't have a diversity of thought around the table. And I think uh, it's not that's not just with uh, men and women in the workplace, but I think there's also racial diversity and you know intellectual diversity uh, and a variety of kind of facets. And any one group feeling like they can't truly contribute uh, to the business. Thank you, Kate. Okay, what is bro culture? So I think at, at, its, at its purest definition, I think bro culture is when you have in a company at the center of power a group of men, often youngish white men, who, who allocate opportunities and influence among themselves and based on their friendships as well as their professional relationships to the exclusion of other groups, particularly to the exclusion of women. And along with it, I think, can come a sort of, you know, a toxic perspective or treatment of women. So a disrespect for women that kind of comes through in the behavior and the dynamics and in the meetings. So I think um, explicitly and very stereotypically, bro culture is guys, white males, that um, act and, and exhibit behaviors that are completely alienating and non-inclusive to any other class around them, specifically women or people of color uh, or people of different ethnic background. And then implicitly, um, we see it, even if you get rid of those explicit, very visible behaviors, it still can persist um, in a way that is still um, behavior that is non-inclusive and that people don't feel comfortable, aren't included in conversations, aren't included in decision making. Um, and that's, that's, I think, the, the arguably harder pieces to eradicate or to address because they're not as visible. They're not, they're not the kind of things that you could say, like, get rid of the, you know, don't turn the ping pong table into a beer pong table at five o'clock. Um, but they're more about the, the decision making process, who's involved, um, and how that plays out uh, implicitly within a company. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the opposite of inclusive in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all that. I, I, I mean, a few adjectives, I think, come to my mind. Um, it's hard to define, but it does feel to me like a white male problem. Um, I might male, by the way. Uh, just like call out, we have three white males on the it's panel. The bro-y panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that there's a shallowness to it. There's a frat mentality to it. There's a there's a in a a kind of a culture of objectification of of things and people. Um, it's a, it's a, I think, bro culture typically treats people like things, and um, and there's an entitlement to it, a sameness, and if you're not one of us, it's um, you're not valued. Yeah. None of which is always explicit. <coughs> it's, it's body language to systems that are created inside yeah. of companies and everything. And it, it's a good point that you made, Kate. You know, this panel with. with three men and one woman, female moderator, uh, that is actually interesting and kind of somewhat intentional, I think, for, by the organizers to say if the, if the is, is it easier for men to change bro culture than women? You know, because of you, the positions that you, that you are in. So I think it's really helpful to engage men around this, this issue. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually gonna start with you, Brian, 
flip things around a little bit. So you've worked in the sports and the venture and the tech industries and at an elite university. Um, these are definitely just sort of stereotypically the more male dominated industries. And I think it's important to get specific. So what, what were some experiences or what did you see um, in these industries that was problematic? So if we're acknowledging that this is not a problem in every organization, but that is a problem in many, yeah. and specifically tech and, and avoiding it in, the, in, a, in a startup, um, maybe starts with understanding what's really going on. What did you see and what are some, maybe a specific Taylor story that you could help us with? Yeah, so I, I, I guess I'll go to the sports industry, right? It's <clears throat> male dominated. Um, it's historically been very white, uh, male dominated. And, um, you know, if you look at that environment, I'll use the Super Bowl. You know, I've been to nine Super Bowls. I've only stayed for the game like four times because you go on Thursday and you, that's where you conduct business in that industry. Um, and what is the stereotypical um, reflection around that time? It's the Super Bowl parties. And there's the Super Bowl parties that is the workplace, um, but is the breeding ground for some you know, pretty abhorrent behavior mm -hmm. that goes on. Um, and um, so that's like very explicit. Uh, what's challenging or what's problematic about that is that then that same behavior, less explicitly, permeates back into the workplace where it's those same individuals that are making the decisions or that are um, you know, driving the strategies and if you're not a white male um, in that environment, why do you even want to be in that industry? Why do you even want to be associated with that okay. industry? So that, that's probably the extreme cases that I've seen historically. But I think it, it then has made its way into Silicon Valley without a doubt that it may not, it, we may be doing a better job about the explicit pieces, but I think we still have a long way to go. Uh, and it starts with how we think about recruiting, how we think about hiring, how we think about onboarding. I'll talk a little bit about this. Yep. Um, in some of your other questions, things that we are doing explicitly to make sure that the, it's that implicit, um, kind of less visible bo form of non-inclusiveness that we also eradicate. Yeah. And I, I have a question too for especially the, the three guys. When you see the behavior, um, you know, and for any of us actually, but in particular when it's a male environment, and you don't say something, that's, it's, it's probably still painful um, but it's also really painful to say something. Um, but it's also perhaps all of our responsibility now as leaders to speak out. So what, is, what, what are the tactics and strategies for men to speak out in those environments when behavior is either you know, overt or perhaps not as directly uh, being exclu you know, ex excluding women or, or perhaps even insulting um, maybe not only women, but anyone who's not bro. How, maybe uh, Garrett or Brent, you can dive in on that as well. How do you speak up and how do we encourage men to speak up in those moments? And I think it's, it's a, I encourage you to be vulnerable about this because I know it's really hard. You're looking at me, Garrett. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I, I think it is hard. <clears throat> I think there needs to be a, I mean, it, 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 uh, it's a, it's a, it needs to be a cultural mandate that is um, set from the top and adopted at every level. And I think, I think when there's a culture of, of um, striving for something better and, and you're not the only one trying to eradicate that behavior, but everybody's kind of on the same team working toward it, I think you can have that conversation a little easier. Um, like when you're the only one, you know, recognizing there's a problem and trying to eradicate it, it it's harder, lonelier, more risky. Mm -hmm. Somebody's if, having conversations before the moment occurs. But if there's a culture occurs. of of eradication, then yep. I think. Yep. Garrett, thoughts? Honey, yeah. Honey, I, I also have you ever think, jumped in and said, "Hey, that's not cool, man." Yeah, I mean, being vulnerable here. I mean, we walked an employee out of the office, like because we felt that we had very clearly uh, articulated the cultural values of the organization. And we have been very thoughtful and, and trying really hard to make sure there's representation around each one of the teams. I think that's one maybe facet of this question that maybe it's not part of the question, but if you're able to see people like you and you feel like across the leadership table, the boardroom, the director level, the manager level, there's like a representative team, um, I think that uh, 
really helps kind of accentuate the fact that like all voices really matter. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we've, uh, you know, we haven't really had any significant um, issues around like, um, where, where I feel there need to be, I mean, there was one time I actually tallied like men and women and who gets interrupted, right? Like after reading Emily's book, mm -hmm. and I just did kind of like a silent notebook. And it, I was taken aback by just like a lot of the kind of unconscious um, uh, behavior from a lot of the men in the room of like interrupting, right? Where uh, kind of move quickly, sp you know, sp speak on your feet. You know, how do you, how do you breed in an environment where people that are more thoughtful uh, and, and, and don't have thoughts that come right to the top of their head can also participate in a strategic or business um, decision. So I think it's like, how do you run meetings effectively? How do you um, run onboarding effectively? I, mean, I think there's like a, a lot of things that we're trying to get better at. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what it's yeah. Okay, can, well, can I, I guess you talked about Can I also add to that? Yeah. Please do. Um, just jumping off of where Garrett left off, like it's really about modeling. You mentioned that it starts at the top. And so I've been very focused um, over the last several years, and I continue to need to get better at this and want to work at this about being specifically um, a listener and a moderator in my E-team setting. And we have half of our E-team is non-white males, two women, two men of color, and they need to know that they converse, interact, um, don't ever get talked over. If I observe that, I make sure that they are brought into the conversation yeah. so that everybody in that room takes that same approach when they go to their version of E-Team and so forth. And yeah. so that, it, it, that to me, I think is the most effective way is through modeling that listening and curating the conversation. And uh, for me, a good E-Team meeting is when I say very little. And the less I say, the better, so that they don't feel like it's coming from the white male. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, super interesting. And modeling seems so critical. And I think people pay it close attention when one of, one of us as leaders does something um, very clear and direct. So <clears throat> Kate, I want to bring your voice into this. Um, you've had experiences in investment companies and venture funds. You've made investments in teams. Um, you've worked in many environments, <coughs> male dominated. You've also taken over companies from a man. Um, I, I want to bring this idea forth, though, from your point of view. Um, uh, around like what have you seen in terms of the impacts of bro culture and then I guess the other question is a counterpoint is like hey let's let's take the devil's advocate position to say like is it all bad to have sameness because that's the challenge right I think sameness makes us a fluid and efficient and, and effective and uh, when you're looking at making investments and you look at teams you're looking for their ability to work together and how does the dynamic of you know people who have shared common past experiences of being in a sports team or in a fraternity play in, if at all. Um, I'd just love to hear your perspective um, just in light of what's been said to date as well. Yeah, I mean, when for, for teams to <clears throat> be at their most effective, you, you, need, you, want, you want everyone on the team to feel in their comfort zone and to feel connections to each other. And you want everyone to feel, you know, totally themselves and totally comfortable being able to speak up. And I think that that's why, you know, not just in bro culture and lots of different sort of, you know, companies that end up having like a, a, a type or a group think of sorts. I, I think that's why some people use as a shortcut to that. Like, well, if I hire a bunch of people like me and we're all, we, we all have, you know, a lot in common, then we'll get to that end result more quickly and we'll have that kind of alignment in our teams and then we can work together efficiently and effectively. I think the, um, you know, what I watch out for with that and why, why I don't build my own teams that way is that, you know, my, my favorite part of a well-functioning team is when you hear people challenging each other and coming at things <laughs> from different perspectives and, you know, I, like, like I know I don't have one of my teams where I need it to be when I throw out an idea and you know everybody is sort of like okay, and you know <laughs> writes it down instead of you know taking it and batting it around and and you know giving point counterpoint to and, and really you know being vocal in in challenging things and challenging ideas. That's what comes from more diversity of perspective. And so that's you know whether it's one of my own teams or whether it's it's you know one of the companies that I'm advising or thinking about investing in. That's what I'm always pushing them on. Is you know if you've got too many people that look the same, sound the same, you're probably not, as a leader, getting that that point-counterpoint challenge that you need to make every idea better. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, like, and there is data that says diverse teams are more high performing. Yeah. So, but that data doesn't seem to necessarily get uh, integrated into people's thinking, or maybe there's not enough uh, proof points of that. But I think it's important to, to show those proof points when they occur. Yeah, and yeah, but and, and also to expect <coughs> that you know you 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 can and should have that diverse representation, but also everybody on a team should be should be connected and should you know. Be you know be friends ideally right mm -hmm. and, and in alignment and doing something yeah. together and I, I mean I think that you can have both I mean I mean I don't know about you guys but like I don't like my friends to all be just like me like I you know, I love hanging out with people yeah. who are really different and are bringing different things into the conversation yeah. I think it's the same with teams at work yeah and that leadership skill of bringing together the team to create the a team actually is what we have I think that's I think for. that's an important point because a lot of times we talk <clears throat> about this as a hiring problem. Um, a pipeline problem or we can pin it on a bunch of different things but um, I think actually inside of companies the way you build teams project teams uh, like actually matters yeah. and and keep in being able to do it with the intelligence to understand that diversity makes better product makes better decisions and so building teams so that it's not always the same people working to I mean I'm a little biased because it's what our software does. Well, I was going to go to you next. So you build a company to address this. So yeah, I think I mean, it's good for you to share. The problem we're not solving isn't bro culture, yeah. but, it, but, it, but it is the ability to build really dynamic teams to, of high performance. Um, and, and diversity of, of that team is a big part of it. Right, so like, what have you learned in your work that, that, you know, that works, right? You've got this software to high, basically encourage high performing teams. Diversity is a piece of it. Is there some research, some like, um, nuggets that you would share with us that would be actionable for, for other leaders in the room? Um, on diversity, well, it, it's, clear, it, it's clear that cognitive diversity yields better results. And it's clear that if we have um, that cross, like companies that operate in a more matrixed way and cross-functional way innovate better. Mm -hmm. It all goes to the bottom line. Um, but you know, sometimes we we think of, of diversity. It's it's really important. Like we all, we think of diversity as as a mandate because it's the right thing to do, and it is the right thing to do. But it's also better strategy. It, it's better for product. It's better for companies. Like it, it, it it's what makes has made this country competitive at a global scale is the ability to build product from diverse mindsets. Yep. And uh, I think you have to be able to, to do that at the micro level inside of a company in order to make the whole company yep. you know, more uh, accepting. Interesting. So let's talk a little, shift a little bit to what, how do we, uh, how do we avoid a bro culture? And I'm going to go to you, Garrett. Um, for a period of time, you said Handshake's exec team was made up of white males. Um, you set it as a goal to have a more diverse team. Um, you were the founder of the company, so it wasn't a fixing something that was broken that you didn't create, but it was perhaps something you recognized over time. So what are your pieces of advice based on your experience for how to, uh, if you're starting out in a company and you want to avoid building this culture from the beginning, maybe things you would do differently, what are your, your tips and tricks? Yeah, great, great, great question. I, I think I also feel very fortunate to have John on our team, whose wife wrote Protopia and has been very hands-on with helping us think through and learn from like best-in-class companies. And Does she advise companies around this? I don't actually, I, I know that I've talked to her several yeah. times about it, um, never in any like formal capacity. Uh, and then J John and, and our whole founding team is very passionate about this as well. Yeah, so we started off predominantly, and uh, predominantly with like my two co-founders who are both white males at Michigan Tech. Uh, and you know, today I'm really happy to, to say that across our leadership team and director level team, where there's 50-50 gender parity, uh, there's 30% non-white uh, leaders within the company, and I think it's through just um, the the tactical, the, probably the number one thing that no, there's two things that I've learned. One of which is, if you think about the actual funnel itself of like how many candidates you're reaching out to, how many are coming on site, how many are you know potentially at an offer stage with you. There, you know, there's pretty standard drop-off across men and women, uh, you know, across the interview process, and you need to make sure that you're you're filling up the top of funnel with enough representation so that you're actually going to see um, a diverse set of candidates at the, at the finalist stage. And so we actually, I said, like we do a company level OKRs and personal OKRs, and we like set goals across the company around increasing representation on each one of the teams, as, and and actually setting a specific. 
uh, number of underrepresented and female candidates in each one of the rules that we're meeting. And I think putting numbers behind making sure that um, you know, when you're running searches with like search firms, like I want, I, I need to meet more women in this role, I need to meet more underrepresented candidates, really holding those search firms accountable, delivering those results, uh, and then also leveraging people in your network. So actually reaching out and specifically asking for uh, a di di uh, diverse slate of referrals from our investor community has been like some tactical tips, I'd say. And then when those candidates do come on site, one other big thing that we've seen in uh, uh, improvement in is making sure that they're when they do come on site they see people that look like them they're interviewing people that look like them there's a diverse set of perspectives around the table interviewing them because I think uh, you know diversity is hard work but like I think bl bl inclusion and belonging can like very much start today and making sure that you run a really um, you show off those cultural attributes in that interview process really has been meaningful and in, 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 in you know building a more diverse team and handshake um, yeah, it's super interesting that it's not just a matter of getting them people that have different backgrounds and look different in the seats, but actually what you do when they get there to create that culture where you unlock the diversity, totally. the value of that diversity. So, I, Brian, I'd like to go to you because you yeah. have a sort of a, a methodology you've developed or a set of a framework yeah, a couple, around this. Yeah, a, a couple of important pillars that we um, <clears throat> talk a lot about and always kind of go back to. One is um, DE&I, right? Everybody, most companies have a, a either DE&I or DE&I. Uh, framework that they're thinking about. Um, for, our, for us, we, we really believe you can't have E&I. Uh, Does everybody know what E&I stand for? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah. But we believe you can't really have the E&I unless you have the D. And so it, it does start with diversity. Today, 65% of our team members are non-white males. Uh, we want to continue to improve on that and get better at that. And so it starts with how we think about recruiting, how we are very specific about making sure there's no bias. It's brought into our recruiting process, so we've brought in outside firms to help us understand unconscious bias and all the other types of bias that can be folded into the recruiting process that therefore um, leads into our hiring process. And then the onboarding. And so once um, people are part of our company, that segues into the second pillar, which we call MDEV, which is really about manager development, uh, because that relationship that that person who starts with us, whatever their background is, whatever their race is, whatever their gender is, that relationship with their manager is going to be a really important conduit for them to make sure that they feel included and that they're part of the process and they know that their voice, their contribution, their strategic thinking, their, their participation in our sprint planning and our strategic planning uh, matters like everybody else in the company. And, so, um, and that doesn't just go for <coughs> managers. We have IC coaching circles and manager coaching circles. And then all of that really is built on a, um, a foundation. We've invested a lot in a co as a company in crucial conversations, if anybody's read the book, um, so that people know that they can have those types of conversations. As hard as it is, people can have that kind of conversation with me, and it's important for, for me to let them know that they can have that conversation with me. And there's, there's no repercussions, and we try, it's easier said than done, but we try really hard to make sure that the power dynamics and the, the leveling um, is, is removed so that people can, you know, start with their heart, say what they want, start with facts, you know, all of the part of that framework. Um, and, and that's an intentional way that we are working together, um, regardless of what your background is. Yeah, that shared language, which is so helpful. Yeah. And people know what you mean when you say, I'm going to yeah. come from my heart on yeah. this. Um, how do you know you're doing well? How do you measure? I mean, you're doing a lot of good things. And it's impressive that Handshake, um, Garrett's company, and Remind, Brian's company, are in Silicon Valley. Um, the two of you are in Salt Lake City Salt Lake, and yeah. New, New, York. New York, yeah. But you know, Silicon Valley is sort of the one of the, the lightning rod areas around this. Uh, but you have managed to recruit diverse teams. That's impressive. Sixty-five percent of your senior leadership team is, is half of it is not white male. It's really hard uh, work you've been doing there. But how do you know if it's working internally? Like, how do you know if the employees are having the feeling you want them to have of inclusion and belonging? Uh, well, was there anything, any, yeah, anyone yeah. to jump I mean, in on that? I think one thing has just been, I'm, I come from an engineering background. We love to like, as all startups and, and high performing companies do, try to like measure outcomes and understand what influences those outcomes. One tool, there's a lot, variety of tools out there that help you measure um, cultural engagement across your employee population. And we, we work with a firm called Culture Amp, which is yep. like, I think is one of the most valuable tools in building a company period to give you the kind of sentiment from your employee population. And they run specifically a industry benchmark like the diversity and inclusion um, 
uh, kind of culture amp survey measuring and helping ask very specific engagement questions around facets of uh, does the leadership team value diversity around the table? Do I as an employee feel uh, all of all belonging? Uh, does my manager care about my personal development? Like, and they, they've worked with uh, kind of scientists to help develop like a really clear benchmark of how you're doing in comparison to your peers, mm -hmm. as well as like what then specific, based on what's under benchmark or not trending in the right direction, like how do you actually that put programs in place? Uh, and we then put programs in place, you know, we've, each time we run this, we put a program in place or two programs in place, and then try to measure, like, did that influence the outcome? Mm. And then if not, like, well, how do we go back to the drawing board to run another program to help drive that? Um, but I, I think, like, measuring it has been very helpful at understanding the sentiment from every level within the organization. Yeah, it's interesting as your organization grows, too, you can see pockets, right? Like, yeah. if some teams are, are doing better than others, and then you can have that as a conversation with the leader to say this is something you need to be totally. held accountable for. So, so we do similar, we don't use culture amp, we've used the top six questions that come from the Gallup survey, mm -hmm. those top six questions that are, have been proven over research to be most highly correlated to a productive and engaged team. Um, and then we do that two times a year. And to that point about localization, we then um, look at the data, look at the information at, at a group level. And so, you know, the engineering team might in one period have a, one of the questions, you know, I know it's expected of me at work, that they didn't perform as well on as they did the last time. And so then our VP of engineering, his managers, and that entire group yeah. can really kind of lean in on that and understand what's going on there, how do they change that? And it might be completely different in our marketing organization, kind of what their results are telling them to focus on yeah. as, a, as a group. Uh, really interesting. I'm entangled, we use PECON, P-A-K-O-N, similar tool. It's been really transformative for that measurement piece. It seems really critical. Kate, I want to turn to you. Uh, I want to move a little bit to the third component here, which is like, when you have a bro culture, how do you change it? And you took over Princeton Review as CEO from, was it from the founder? From Not from directly John? from John, but it, it, the, his spirit certainly was. Certainly, certainly was, was, was alive. Yeah, and he, and and he, and he did a great job building George, that business. Yeah. And, and yeah. you took it on, and it's a very different job when you take over a company or a culture. Um, and actually, Brian, you also took over a company or a culture. And um, so that's, I'd love to hear from you, Kate, uh, the difference there. And you talked about the fact that at Princeton Review, most of the customers were female, but the senior leadership was all male. And yeah. What, so did you just that fact there, but can you share a little bit more about how you made changes if they were required and what was going on when you joined. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you first joined, you're just trying to figure out, like, what, are, what, what is sort of built into this culture and the behaviors and the ways that people make decisions. And you can see a lot just when you look at where you're at coming in on gender distribution. And in our case, we did have a majority female customer base. It was a lot of, you know, moms of high school students were making the purchase decisions on the retail side. We also, our, our teacher tutor base was predominantly female. And then when I, you know, first got our stats and working up from the, you know, entry level positions up through middle management into executive teams, it was just fewer and fewer women, which is not unusual that, I mean, that it's like that at a lot of companies, right? But that's, gets you your starting point of, of how, how are we going to change this? How much of it do I need to bring in outside hires and outside persons? perspectives versus how much can I move people up from within. And um, you know, an interesting thing about the, the companies that I've taken over, which come from you know, the, you know, the, the entrepreneurs that will start businesses and create these big businesses you know, out of nothing are often very alpha male. And they, and, they, and they had a very dominant personality and a very directive personality. And what happens is you find across other employees and the employees who remain that, they're, um, that, that they've, they've been trained to sort of follow direction instead of to, to speak up and to actively participate in the problem solving and the decision making. So there's this, re, there's this resetting that you have to do where people are you know, expecting to be told what to do instead of coming to meetings expecting to participate and, and come to a conclusion. And so as you start to just change some of the working practices. Um, how did you do that, by the way? I mean, were you explicit and said, this is how I want things to go now, or how did you actually activate that change, make it clear that that's what you wanted? Yeah, well, because well, I mean, first, well, what first happens is like you get, as a leader, you get confused because you think people are going to do that, and then, you know, you realize that like you've said some random thing and people have gone off and done that even though they think it's a terrible idea, mm -hmm. and you're like, well, what? why did you do that? Well, because you said to, you know, so you, you start to uncover that and then you just start like pushing really directly on like, don't, don't do things because I said to do them. Like if you think it's a bad idea, 
please tell me, and we'll discuss it, and then I might still say go do it, but you know, let's, let's have the conversations and be clear. So you start literally like catching these things that are, that are happening, and, you, and you, you get to the bottom of like, well, why did, the, why did that action get taken? Um, and then you start pulling everybody back together and, and just get really explicit, We're like, okay, that happened accidentally. Now we're actually going to sit here and hash it out on this on this topic, and we're going to decide what we're going to do, and then we're going to be clear, and we're going to go do it. And so you, you start, you know, modeling in the meetings and push. You do a lot of pushing in the meetings. And um, like a story. Let's have the, let's put that that <clears throat> decision like right out here on the table in front of us, and be very explicit about what we're deciding and why. And you're sort of in doing that, you're unearthing what was unspoken mm-hmm. in the culture, in the practices of how people do things, and, and you're getting it out in the open, and yeah. then you can start changing it much more easily. Can I, can I accentuate one, I think, really important point Kate made um, kind of early on there about having your organization reflect your users and your customers. And so you were talking about how a lot of your users' customers were women, um, both on the tutoring side but on the customer side. And that inspires us to, to do the same thing because so many of who we serve, particularly, you know, we're in 90% of Title I schools, so we see very clearly the people we serve. And we want, we want them to see us and, and vice versa and reflect our organization um, in that same way. So people that have come from that background, um, you know, I'm a white male, I didn't play lacrosse, I grew up actually in a pretty low socioeconomic part of Oregon, didn't realize it at the time, my parents were school teachers, had everything I needed, but when I look back on it now, I realize a lot of the people I went to school with either didn't graduate or if they did, they, they never left that area. And yeah. so having us reflect who we serve is a really powerful way to make sure you're striving to be diverse, be equitable, yeah. be inclusive. And consumers are expecting that more too, to feel that brand as authentic. Um, I want to bring one other piece into the conversation before we wrap. Uh, Brent, you, um, you work in Salt Lake City, you have previously worked in New York City and San Francisco, um, and we talked about the fact that the Mormon religion is more prevalent in that area, of course. And then, you know, we talk about diversity in a number of ways. Gender is one thing, but also allowance for and recognition of and invitation uh, to be who you are. Um, and I'm curious if that's been something that's come up, or how do you be inclusive of people of different religious backgrounds, given that um, it's such a you know environment that has more of a Mormon culture than other places and more religious culture probably than other startups area areas. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, when I moved there from San Francisco, it was hard. I was nervous about be, being able to build a, um, a, a diverse team and one that is filled with empathy. And, um, and you know, I don't know, I, I don't know, we're, we're pretty purposeful. And, like, we spend a lot of time on cultural fit when we interview people. Um, we use, you know, several different, like we try to build the top of the funnel in our recruiting uh, as broad a way as we can. But we also really try to stand for something in, in that community. So, you know, making sure that, that our brand voice, and I'm not talking about our products brand, but our company cultural brand, we're very clear about our values internally, we're very clear about communicating those externally. and. Um, so for our company to start the first queer tech event in Salt Lake City it was a big deal. Mm. And we make sure we're very public about how we think about these things and standing for something. And honestly that fills so far the, the top of the funnel and hiring for us has been filled with, with people who are very much aligned with those things. So yeah. I think delineating your own values, even at the very, we're early, even at the very early stage. We've even had like a half day workshop on belonging. Mm. We're 10, 12 people, mm. <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, yeah. you think start, start right. early and you've got to be clear from the get go and you communicate them internally and externally, oh. actively. Well, it's interesting when you put what you stand for out there, then you're a magnet for people who are attracted yes, to that. And uh, it is so true that when you get to 50 people as a startup, it's sort of you're fixing the problem, I think. Right. So if you do it right from the beginning, you're going to you save it, yourself a lot like of It's just like any other type of debt. Yeah. Tech, yeah. tech yeah. debt, yeah. I guess capital, not yeah. monetary debt, but diversity yeah. debt will mm. kill you and yeah. kill companies. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, last a minute here. Well, I'm going to do a quick lightning round question. Um, if, to everybody, if you could quickly tell me what is a piece of advice you have for leaders to avoid or remedy bro culture? If there's just one piece of advice for this group of people who may be interested in uh, how they could do 
um, a better job, or, or you know, as they're starting their companies, what's one piece of advice? We'll start here, work, work our way down. Um, I, uh, I think in Handshake, it's like listening to your ERGs and listening to the different communities across your company and really getting close ERG to, stands for? Uh, employee Resource Group. Okay. Uh, so getting close to uh, those groups and how, uh, and their sentiment around how you can improve as a team and then uh, be specific around what goals you're trying to measure and what you're trying to improve and, and get the whole team on board with it. Listening and inclusiveness, interesting. Go ahead. I would say make sure that you're noticing the talented women who are deeper in your organization at more junior levels, telling them you see their potential, and working with them actively on how you can promote them and elevate them. Nice. Uh, invest in it. Invest in being inclusive. Um, model and um, you know just make sure it's a part of the fabric of everything you do in every conversation you have. Yeah, I think I said my advice, which really is like it starts at the very beginning. You've got to communicate it actively, constantly. It's in the way you build teams. It's in the way you communicate when you're in the teams. And you've got to, like, I think be very purposeful about all of those things. And it's, you can't, diversity, inclusion, belonging, that doesn't happen to you. you like, you have to make that happen. Like, it, it requires effort. It's a great point to end on, and I want to thank my amazing panel, our amazing panel, for your words of wisdom and your sharing today. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause.